So thanks for the, uh, the invitation and it's a, it's a pleasure to speak uh, about fantastic trees. There were uh, some fantastic trees presented already in the Vector Commitment Day by uh, uh, Chris uh, and uh, uh, the previous talk on discrete log based uh, PCs. So my name is Aline. I just joined Aptos Lab as a research scientist. Uh, we're building an L1 for smart contracts. We're looking to, to hire, so feel free to talk to me if you do research or engineering uh, and join us. The goal of this talk is, is uh, twofold. First of all, we're not going to go in depth on any of the constructions. Uh, that would take too much time and there's too many constructions to talk about. So instead, I kind of just want to paint a landscape of, of what's out there in terms of trees. And uh, I, even, I can't even paint a full landscape as some of the, the constructions were presented today actually, but um, I think it'll still be interesting for you guys. And really the goal of this talk is to spark curiosity and um, incite new research in this space. Uh, so I hope you'll come out uh, inspired to work on, on tree-based disease from this talk. Okay, so we're going to start by basically um, dismissing VCs with constant size proofs, as amazing as they are. Uh, then we're going to talk about moco trees and dismiss them too, because they have some problems. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the three uh, or four constructions, lattice-based constructions, polynomial-based constructions, and vertical trees, which Chris briefly touched upon. Okay, so let me start by dismissing constant size VCs. Uh, so there's a, line, a long line of work on constant size VCs started by Catalano, Fiore, and Messina, I believe is the earliest reference, uh, and then Libert Jung and KZG. These things are great. You have a vector of, let's say, eight files. You can commit to them using your favorite uh, constant size VC scheme. And then you can compute proofs for each individual position. So for example, you have pi eight, which convinces anybody that F8 is the eight file under the commitment C. Let me enable the laser pointer. Uh, so these things are nice and uh, it takes you at least linear time to compute all the proofs because each proof is constant size. So you have to output n things. Uh, so you spend at least omega n time. Uh, but unfortunately, when something changes, like let's say the fourth file changes in the vector, you not only have to update the commitment, but you have to update all of these proofs. And now since these proofs are constant size, they don't intersect at all. They don't share any information. Uh, this basically implies an omega n lower bound on the time to update all proofs. So I basically came, claim that the constant size VCs are not maintainable because of this. And this is quite inherent. Uh, and there's some things you can do about them. And Wei Jie Wang talked about this to some extent, like you can do time space trade-offs where you defer the updates and you only apply them when you serve the proof. But uh, that, that can be nice for some applications, but not for others where you just wanna serve proofs on the fly instead of spending computation time. Okay, so uh, this is why we don't like constant size VCs and we like tree-based VCs better. Uh, what trees, well, of course, Merkle trees are the first trees we think about. We have a bunch of leaves, we hash them, then we repeat hierarchically. You probably all know this, so I'm not gonna bore you. And we get a Merkle root, okay? Uh, this was a, a seminal work by Ralph Merkle, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody loves this stuff. Uh, how do you prove something in a Merkle tree? You give a path of sibling nodes and the verifier takes the leaf that it's verifying and recomputes the hash along the parents by using the siblings and then eventually checks that the hash the verifier got is the same with the root hash of the Merkle tree. Uh, that's the ground truth. Um, so this is a log and size proof. It's very small. You're sending 32 bytes per sibling node, for example, it's very efficient. So a proof of in a tree of 4 billion things will take you something like 960 bytes, it can be very small. Um, the time to update all proofs is also really nice in Merkle trees because for example, if H4 changes, uh, I only need to update this path of uh, uh, from H4 along to the root, right? So I'm only doing logarithmic time work. And this is why Merkle trees can be better than constant size VCs. The time to maintain proofs is, is much, much more efficient. You only do logarithmic work, you don't do linear work. All right. But Merkle trees are not perfect. They, they present some, several challenges. And, and in this talk, I want to talk about three of them, uh, specifically the lack of stateless update, which Chris's talk, talk uh, touched upon, the lack of proof aggregation in Merkle trees, or I should say efficient proof aggregation and the lack of database friendliness when you actually want to store Merkle trees on disk, as is the case in many cryptocurrencies like Ethereum um, and so on. Uh, so first, uh, what do I mean by stateless updates? Uh, Chris touched upon this, but imagine you have a setting where a verifier just maintains the, the Merkle root, the digest, the commitment of your vector, in other words, and you have people who tell 
this uh, this uh, um, verifier that uh, hey you know that the third file in the vector changed by delta three can you please update your root hash and if you use Merkle trees this verifier who has this root hash only and doesn't have the tree can do nothing to update it in in fact in order to update it this uh, verifier must be given the Merkle proof for the old F3. And what the verifier will do is it'll take the new F3 and hash up to obtain the new root, and then the verifier can update its root, right? So this is not stateless. Uh, um, you, you need to give the proof for the modified file in order to update the vector commitment, right? And in some applications, this is problematic. And Anka touched upon this in her talk when, when talking about stateless cryptocurrencies. Um, so th that's one problem with Merkle trees. Another problem is proof aggregation. If you're proving one thing like F3, this is nice, but if you're proving two things, well, you kind of have to give two proofs. You do save a little, like you can see, you don't need to send this hash anymore because you'll recompute it as you hash up from F5. So you do save a little, but not a lot really. Asymptotically, if you're proving K things, you still have to give K Merkle proofs. So it's K log N size. Uh, the aggregated proof size. And there's not much you can do about this in Merkle trees beyond just to throw a snark at the problem and aggregate these proofs uh, using a snark, which can be quite inefficient or might require you to use these uh, new snark friendly hash functions that uh, uh, perhaps need more cryptanalysis for us to get comfortable with them. And uh, lastly, this is something that I was thinking about during my PhD uh, early on, but I never got to work on. Uh, Merkle trees are not very easy to store on disk, uh, uh, it turns out. So imagine I have a Merkle tree of n leaves and I, I wanna store it on disk. I at minimum have to store these n minus one internal nodes of the Merkle tree on disk, right? So I have a linear overhead in terms, of, in terms of, of disk overhead. And it's a bit worse than that because a database has its own overhead. Like usually you put this stuff in a key value store uh, where, where the key is the position of the node and the value is the hash of the node. And databases use their own trees internally, like LSM trees or B trees or whatever, and they have their own overhead. So you're storing a tree inside of a tree and you're doing a lot of reads whenever you wanna read a simple hash. There's a lot of write and read amplification. This is really a problem in practice. And I think if you wanna be convinced of this because you don't believe me, just ask anybody who's implementing a, a, a cryptocurrency and they'll tell you uh, writing and reading Merkle trees from disk is actually a big slowdown in, in the validation, during validation. Uh, in fact, it's even worse than that because often you want to create a persistent uh, uh, um, Merkle tree where you can uh, keep track of the version. So for example, you want to store both the path for H8, but also the path for an updated H8 using uh, path copying. And that implies kind of a logarithmic overhead for update. And, and it's a bit worse than that. Okay, so uh, now that I told you about all of these things that Merkle trees are not so good at, I want to go over a few constructions that address uh, these things. Of course, there's no single construction that addresses all of them. Uh, that's ground for future work. And I'll touch upon that at the end of the talk. Uh, and I want to start with lattice-based DCs. Um, and as, uh, as Chris pointed out, the first uh, work on lattice-based DCs is uh, by Papaman II et al. And the key ingredient in their construction is this algebraic hash function. So in a Merkle tree, normally we use SHA-256. We input uh, two hashes to SHA and we get a SHA hash, right? In a lattice space, we see by Papa Mantu et al., this hash function uses two matrices L and R and does a linear combination of, of, of the two inputs. Now, this is an extreme oversimplification uh, because I'm kind of pretending like you can take the output of the hash function and feed it back in. But in practice, uh, in this construction, you can't actually do that. The codomain of the hash function is not the same as the domain, and there's a layer of complication that I'm going to completely ignore due to lack of time. Uh, but I still think the key ideas will come through, as we'll see in a second. Uh, and again, the goal of this talk is to, is to inspire you and, and, and stir up your curiosity so that you can actually read this paper uh, uh, after. So uh, how does the lattice space construction by Pamantu at all work? you have your leaves uh, uh, in the tree and you apply the hash function to them hierarchically. So, so you hash this, uh, th this last level, you get a new level, and now you continue on this, uh, on this level too. So for example, you take these two children, you take L times left child, R times right child, you can distribute the matrix product and do the same thing here uh, on, on, on these guys. And then finally you can take the root left times left child, R times right child, Again, you can distribute the matrix product. So it kind of looks like this. Uh, and it's, it's pretty nice because the root is a linear combination of these, of these uh, 
children, as you can see. But of course, because of the oversimplification I made, you might notice that, for example, H6 and H7 would collapse together into the same uh, uh, product because the matrices should commute. The matrix product should commute here. So this is the same matrix product. But in practice, that's not actually what happens because the matrix product doesn't commute. This is just a, an oversight uh, of my oversimplification. So let's just pretend this doesn't happen. And please uh, read the paper if you want to learn more about how this actually works. But at a higher level, uh, the idea is that the, the root digest is just a linear combination of the leaves. And this is very nice because now what you can do is if, if the second leaf changes by delta 2, you can really easily update the root. Like you can just apply this LLR times delta 2 update to this part of the digest, right? And even better, like if you have a proof that you want to update, you can do that on the proof too. Like you can update the proof here with LR delta 2, and you can update the proof here with RH2. Right? So this is what we call a, a homomorphic DC. And uh, I'm, I'm not showing it in the slide, but what I mean by homomorphism is the property is actually, is actually a homomorphism. Like if you had two vectors and you built a tree over each one of these two vectors, you could add up the trees and you would get a tree for the sum of the vector. That's actually what this construction supports, which is really neat and actually has a lot of applications which have not been explored. Um, and, and I encourage all, uh, all of you to think about that. Um, okay, so this kind of is all I want to say about lattice basis. Of course, there's much more to say. Uh, uh, so let's go a little bit ab about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of this construction. So one advantage is, is that it's homomorphic, but again, a subtlety here is that it's homomorphic for a bounded number of updates. So you cannot actually apply uh, too many of these to the tree. Um, you can only do a, a bounded number of updates, which is polynomial in, in some... Um, um, security parameter or something like that. Um, they have a public setup, which is really nice. You can just pick this hash function, anybody can do it, and, and just like in a Merkle tree. And also they're somewhat snark friendly. There's some previous work by Jean Gatol that explores using snarks on this PSTY13 construction. Uh, so unlike Merkle trees, for example, and they're post-quantum secure. Uh, as disadvantages, the proof size can be quite large. So uh, one paper estimates that it's 70 kilobytes using, uh, I want to say, polynomial ring lattices, which are supposed to be more efficient. Uh, and they're slow in practice, too. So updating the digest or verifying the proof or updating the proof all take hundreds of milliseconds. Um, nonetheless, what was really cool about the PSTY13 work is that it showed for the first time that you can have a homomorphic uh, vector commitment or for a homomorphic Merkle tree. Uh, and, and that's the key thing you should take from this and you should think about ways to, to leverage this homomorphism. And I think as open problems here, of course, improving the efficiency is crucial. Getting subvector proofs, uh, including proof aggregation, like Chris mentioned, is, is also extremely interesting. And uh, the subsequent work by, by Chris Spikard et al. Uh, that, that was just presented, um, uh, shows how to get smaller proofs using a trusted setup and also shows how to get a homomorphic lattice-based vertical tree from lattices. So I encourage you to, to check out this paper as well. I will have references at the end of the talk so you can see what these uh, papers actually are. Um, okay, so this is uh, lattice-based VCs. Now I want to talk about polynomial-based VCs. So again, lattice-based VCs kind of address the stateless updates with polynomial-based VCs we're hoping to address the proof aggregation and the stateless updates. And here I'm going to talk about two lines of work, the EDRAX line of work, CPZ18, and the hyperproof line of work, SCP22. Uh, the key ingredient in both of these works are as a multilinear polynomial commitment. Um, I will not spend time talking about what this is, uh, but I encourage you to check out the references. I'm, instead, I'm going to give you an idea of how the uh, EDRAX and hyperproofs uh, tree works. Um, so in both of these works, uh, hyperproofs followed EDRAX, so it was inspired from EDRAX. And in fact, hyperproofs added this tree construction that I'm about to present to you. Uh, EDRAX didn't have it. So what's the idea? The idea is that let's say you have a vector of eight elements, H1 through H8, you can pick a multivariate polynomial of three variables that encodes the vector as follows. It takes the index i, it splits it into bits. So the index uh, is from one to eight, it has three bits. 
And using the bits in, uh, as, as the variables of the polynomial, you can get the uh, value of the vector back. So we all know how to do this. Well, maybe not all of us, but, but uh, it, it's not complicated to do this. Uh, you can interpolate this polynomial and then you can actually build a tree. And unlike Merkle trees, you kind of build this tree from the root to the bottom rather than from the bottom to the root. And you proceed as follows. You start with this uh, multivariate polynomial in the root and you do a division. You divide it by x3 minus zero. x3 is the first variable of the polynomial. And you get a quotient and a remainder as you always do when you divide a polynomial by something. You put the quotient in the root, in the parent and you commit to it. And the remainder, you remember it. Now in the right side, you also divide by something slightly different, x3 minus one. You also get a quotient and a remainder. The quotient will actually be the same as the quotient that you got here. And you've already committed to it in the root. The reason being that these, these monomials just differ by a constant, but the remainder will be different. So now you have a remainder here and a remainder here, and you are ready to recurse. So you will now recurse on the remainder. You'll take that remainder from this node and you'll divide it by x2 minus zero and x2 minus one. That'll give you also a quotient that is the same. You commit to it here using the multilinear commitment scheme. Uh, and again, you get remainders and you recurse. Same here, you had a remainder, you recursed on it, you get quotients, you put it here. And you do this until you exhaust your variables. So here I had x3, here I have x2, here I have x1. And once I have x1, I will be done actually. The remainders that I will get will be the evaluations themselves, will be the, the vector elements. And why is that? Well, intuitively you're doing phi modulo x3 minus zero, modulo x2 minus zero, modulo x1 minus zero, which uh, you can prove that it's actually just phi evaluated at zero, 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 which is just phi of one, which is h of one as defined here. And, and the same holds for, for this guy and all of these other guys. Um, so now this construction, uh, uh, this is all I wanna say about this construction. The idea is that you do, uh, let's say uh, divide and conquer, repeated divisions, you recurse on the remainders, you commit to the quotients that you get inside of the nodes. And then a proof, unlike in the Merkle tree, a proof will consist of the quotient commitments along the path to the leaf that you're proving. So for H1, for example, the proof would be the quotient commitment here, here, and here. Um, and that will be your proof. And in a Merkle tree, if you recall, you gave sibling paths. So this is quite different in some sense. And uh, another thing that, that's not visible here is that this construction is also homomorphic like the lattice based. And uh, that's really what I, what I wanna to touch upon next. Like the advantages of this construction is that it's homomorphic and it's actually for an unbounded number of updates unlike the lattice based one. Uh, and it has the same proof size as Merkle trees. Uh, the reason being that these quotient commitments that you put in these nodes can just be 32 bytes. So it's quite efficient in practice in terms of proof size and it's, Efficient in practice in terms of computation. Now it depends who you ask. You know, if you ask a, a, a lattice-based researcher, uh, uh, it's definitely much faster than lattice. It's probably a hundred times faster. Um, but if you ask a, a, a blockchain developer, this is too slow. And and trust me, I work with blockchain developers these days, and and uh, they think it's too slow. <laughs> so uh, what what a researcher thinks is reasonably fast in practice doesn't doesn't. Uh, hold for engineers. Uh, the other advantage is that it's friendly to inner product arguments for those of you who know what these are and uh, they were mentioned earlier in the discrete log talk. Uh, and in fact, in hyperproofs, we leverage this IPA friendliness to do proof aggregation uh, um, and, and to also build sub vector proofs. Um, and additionally, because of the unbounded homomorphism, you can get a property called unstealability which is again, something we explore in hyperproofs. Uh, so the idea behind instillability is that when you compute one of these trees, which again, if you ask the blockchain engineers, they'll tell you it's very expensive to do. When, you, when you've done all of that expensive computation, you can actually watermark your tree with your identity to make proofs unstealable. Meaning that every time you serve a proof from the tree that you computed, it's watermarked with your identity and everybody can see that you computed it and nobody can change your identity in this proof, right? So we believe this could have interesting applications in cryptocurrencies, this type of unstealability. Of course, uh, uh, there are disadvantages. It's uh, not post-quantum, unlike the lattice-based construction. It does require a trusted setup, unlike the lattice-based construction. And even, even worse, it has linear size public parameters. So your vectors, if you wanna to commit to n leaves, you need to have n public parameters 
that are generated by this trusted setup here. Um, and another disadvantage is the sub vector proofs are quite large, 54 kilobytes. So um, uh, aggregation will only start making sense once you aggregate about 100 proofs or so. Um, but again, I think what is cool about this line of work is that um, it, it added uh, an unbounded homomorphism and it showed that the lattice-based construction can be efficiently instantiated in practice using, of course, a bunch of caveats like the trusted setup and the public parameters. And then what the, what the hyperproofs line of work did is it showed that, well, first of all, that you could build this tree. You don't have to compute proofs individually. You can build a tree efficiently. Second of all, that you can do proof aggregation using IPAs and then the unstillability. And here as open problems, I think it's very interesting to try and reduce the proof size either by improving the IPA or coming up with new strategies and to do it much, much faster, the aggregation, whether again, by improving the IPA or coming up with new strategies. And we have a bunch of, of in-depth talks on hyperproofs. Uh, I have links here to a video presentation and to slides. And I recommend all of you watch uh, Shravan's talk at Usenix Security in August on hyperproofs. Uh, uh, Ali, uh, can yeah. I interrupt mm. you at this point? So ju just for curiosity, can you give like at least an intuition of how you do subvector opening proofs in the tree? And uh, yeah, so right, because uh, I guess you aggregate, right? So you you don't. Yeah, I, I think I can, but but I have to go to a different presentation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't I want to right distract it. Uh, no, 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 it, it's all good. So so it's uh, the idea will be that uh, proof verification it looks kind of like this. So when you verify a proof, you're just verifying a bunch of pairing equations hold. E is a pairing here. Um, PSD of F are, are, uh, is the vector commitment. These are the quotient commitments that I mentioned earlier. Uh, VI is the value you're proving. So you just have a bunch of pairing equations when you, when you prove a bunch of different positions. And using an inner product argument, you can prove that all of these equations hold. Uh, very, very succinctly without giving all of these quotient commitments. You can just prove knowledge of quotient commitments that satisfy these verification equations. Does that uh, make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's pretty clear. Thank you. Yeah, and, and what we use is the BMM19 inner product argument that generalizes uh, bullet proofs uh, to, to not just, uh, um, yeah, that generalizes bulletproof to parents. Okay. Thanks for the question. Uh, good, so now I, I, I wanna tell you a little bit about another construction that was kind of uh, in between EDRAX and hyperproofs. This work occurred in between EDRAX and hyperproofs. It's called an authenticated multipoint evaluation tree. This is work uh, I did with my high school students uh, um, you know, a few years ago while I was a graduate student. Uh, so the key ingredient here is a univariate polynomial commitment like KZG10 rather than a multivariate one. And again, so this work uh, was done after EDRAX and it, in some sense was very inspired from the EDRAX construction. And then hyperproofs was inspired from both of these works. So the idea of this tree from hyperproofs that I just presented was really kind of inspired from the idea of the tree uh, in this AMT work, uh, just applying that to the EDRAX construction. And of course, everything is rooted in the lattice-based uh, construction from Papamantu et al. Um, so what's the idea here? It's very similar to, to hyperproofs or EDRAX. It's you encode the vector in a polynomial, but the polynomial is univariate. So you use an index directly to, to access uh, the vector elements inside the polynomial. And you're also gonna do repeated divisions. You're just dividing by different things. So let's say you have a vector of eight things. You have your interpolated polynomial that it encodes the vector. You divide it by an accumulator over all of the positions. So an accumulator is a polynomial that has roots at all of the positions. You get a quotient and a remainder, as you always do when you divide two polynomials. You commit to the quotient in this node using KZG, a univariate polynomial commitment scheme, and you recurse on the remainder. You have one remainder from here. You're going to divide it by the left half of this accumulator and by the right half of, 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 of this accumulator. And you're going to get a quotient here and a quotient here. They're going to be different. You're going to put them, uh, you're going to commit to them, and you're just going to repeat. Again, like on the remainder that you got from this division, you divide it by the left and right halves. On the remainder that you got from this division, you divide it by the left and right halves. You keep doing this until you run out of uh, your accumulator. And in the leaves, you will get the evaluations themselves. Again, the idea being that you have phi modulo, this huge guy, which contains x minus one, then phi modulo, this other huge guy, which contains x minus one, 
this and this. So in the end, you're just doing phi modulo x minus one, which by the power one remainder theorem is phi of one, which we know is equal to h of one. Uh, uh, and that's that's the idea for why this works. Again, it's a different approach than Merkel because you're starting from the top and you're going all the way to the bottom. And again, this is homomorphic too. Uh, so it actually has the same uh, advantages and disadvantages as Ajax and hyperproofs, except uh, this construction, as far as we can tell, has a quadratic time trusted setup uh, if you want to be able to support homomorphic updates. Uh, and it has n log n size public parameters rather than n size public parameters. Um, so open problems here are to fix the setup and the public parameters. And Wei Jia Wang, who just gave a talk earlier, I think is doing some ongoing work on fixing this. And the n squared time trusted setup, I think he already fixed the n log n size public parameters. I'm not sure if he did, but, but feel free to, to discuss with him. I think both of these are very addressable. And in that sense, once you address all of these, if you think about AMTs and EDRACs, they're kind of dual constructions to one another. Uh, uh, one uses multivariate, other uses uh, univariate. But I think really the holy grail of this AMT construction would be to figure out a way to take this AMT proof, which is just uh, uh, the quotient commitments along the path to the leaf that you're proving, and figure out a way to compress it to a KZG proof. Actually, like algebraically do that. Because if you could do that, then KZG proofs are aggregatable and that would imply aggregation for AMT proofs. Uh, and I haven't been able to do this. And uh, embarrassingly, like this could be something very simple, like uh, uh, maybe it's just a bunch of arithmetic tricks that I'm not seeing. Uh, so if this is possible, that would be amazing. If this is impossible, then somebody should prove it. I tried proving that it's impossible, but I couldn't do that either. Uh, so I think this is a, a really uh, nice open problem to try and work on. We have a, an in-depth blog post on AMT that I encourage you to read. We have slides and we have a bunch of video presentations too that you can look at. Uh, good, so that kind of uh, covers polynomial based VCs which address stateless updates and proof aggregations and have other properties like unstealability and can be reasonably efficient in practice depending on who you ask. Lastly, let's see what we can do about database friendliness. And here I want to point to this Verkle line of work. So in the literature, there is actually the idea of having a, a large arity tree with arity k or arbitrary k. You can find work as early as Dwork Naor in 98, who used this for a stateless digital signature scheme, uh, as early as Catalana Fiore 2008 uh, in Messina. Uh, Libert Jung, Papa Mantu, Tamasia, and uh, Triandopoulos. And then my, my high school student, uh, John Kuzmal, and I in 2018 uh, uh, also started uh, investigating this under the name Verkle trees. Uh, so, what's the idea? The idea is, as Chris uh, Picard explained earlier, you have a higher branching factor in your tree. Rather than binary, you go to K -ary. This implies a smaller height. And interestingly, of course, it also implies fewer internal nodes in your trees, which implies a lower overhead on the database that you store the tree in. Um, and then if you, in, in addition to using a higher branching factor, you commit to the children using a constant size VC, then you can actually get log K and size proofs because you no longer have to give the siblings along the path. So that's uh, very nice. And I'll show you in a second how all of that works. So first of all, why don't you want to do a high arity Merkle tree rather than a vertical tree? Why is that a bad idea? Again, uh, if you want to prove something like H4, this is what the proof would look like. You would be giving all of these siblings at every level. You have log Kn levels and K minus one siblings per level. So the proof size would be K minus one log Kn, which is always greater than log 2n, which is what you would have in a binary tree. So if, if your goal is to optimize your proof size, high arity Merkle doesn't make sense. But if your goal is, for example, to be database efficient, then higher the Merkle might make sense. If you use, let's say, k is equal to 16, I think you get a, um, the proof size is not that much bigger. It's like four times bigger or something like that. Uh, so it could, could make sense in practice. Now, if you use a higher the Merkle, which I'm depicting here, um, I can't obviously depict all of the subtrees in the tree. So these are meant to be subtrees here. Uh, it would look kind of like this, and you would commit to each of the children using a vector commitment scheme in this fashion. So what would be the advantages of this? Of course, you get log k and depth as with the Merkle. Uh, 
but additionally, what you can do because you've used the vector commitment is you can now compute these proofs for every child with respect to a parent. So for example, this proof argues that Y7 is the seventh child of Z. And there's a efficient API you can use for this, an efficient algorithm and a lot of vector commitment schemes. So, so you can basically do a proof all call that in K log K time for, for these K children gives you all of these K proofs here. So this can be very efficient asymptotically at least. And you do this for every, every node in the tree, right? You compute proofs for every node in the tree. So even here, even here, even here and here. Um, uh, and as a result, in addition to committing to the tree using the vector commitment scheme, which will take you order n time, you're doing this extra n log 2k uh, computation for getting these proofs. Uh, so you're doing extra computation in vertical trees. And this, it's, it's all concretely much more expensive too. This is much more expensive than computing hash functions. The vector commitments themselves are much more expensive. So you're giving up a lot of computation just to get a smaller proof size and to get database friendliness. And what does a vertical proof look like? For example, if you're on a proof position H4, what you do now is you no longer have to give the siblings, right? You just give the path with the proofs. And now the verifier can check, for example, that H4 is the fourth child of parent W3 using this proof pi H4 that you gave. Then you can check that W3 is the parent of Y6 at position, sorry, that W3 is the child of Y6 at position three using this proof. Same thing for Y6 with respect to Z, and the proof is log KN sized, um, which is much smaller than, than the log uh, K minus one log KN in a, in a Merkle. Um, and even better, uh, Vitalik Buterin from uh, Ethereum pointed out that these proofs in a vertical tree can be cross aggregated into a single proof. So then actually what you would have to give are, are just these uh, pink commitments along the path and one group element for the cross aggregated proofs in schemes like KZG or Libert Jung or point proofs. Um, so it can be quite efficient in practice. The proof size can be concretely log KN plus one group elements. Uh, so much, much smaller than Merkle trees. Uh, of course, there's no free lunch. If you want to update a Merkle tree, you're going to be doing a lot of work. So you have to update the commitments along the changed path. Uh, so here you have to update the uh, W3 to W3 prime by accounting for the change at position four in, in H4. There you have to update Y6 uh, by accounting for the change at position three in W3. Same thing for the root by accounting for the change at Y6, right? But you're not really done. You also have to update the proofs because these proofs are no longer valid. They all need to change. The proofs along the path really need to change, right? So for example, this proof here at position eight, you need to update it to account for the change at position six in Y6, right? And you need to do this for, for all of the proofs on this level and for all of the proofs of this, of this node here and for all of the proofs of this node. So that implies actually K log K and time for the proof updates because you have log K and levels and at each level you're updating K proofs. Uh, and it would be the same asymptotically in a Merkle tree because you would need to rehash this parent and you would have to do order K work to account for all of the children and you have log K and levels but it's concretely slower in a vertical because the proof updates are much more expensive in a vertical. Uh, so if you look at vertical trees, you have a bunch of advantages. The proof size is log 2k times smaller than in a, in a Merkle. Uh, they're reasonably fast in practice. They're database friendly. They have public setup if you use the right, uh, the right vector commitment like bullet proofs. They're unstealable uh, if you use the techniques from hyperproofs. But they have some disadvantages. They're much slower than Merkle trees, of course, because you use internally not a hash function, but a KZG vector commitment, let's say. Uh, they're not homomorphic unless you use these new techniques that Chris Picard et al. proposed. Um, and they're not friendly to snarks or inner product arguments either. And they even require a trusted setup with other VCs like KZG, Lubeck, Jung, and so on. And open problems here that are worth working on is efficiency uh, in terms of updating the vertical tree, serving proofs fast, if you're not gonna be maintaining proofs. Uh, coming up with a subvector proof for a vertical tree is a super interesting open problem. And even better, can you aggregate proofs into a subvector proofs? Uh, the reason we can't do right now is something that Chris pointed in his talk, 
it's, it's because of this uh, mapping of commitments to, to vector elements that you have to do via a hash function, which breaks any friendliness towards snarks or IPAs. And uh, there was subsequent work on Verkle trees uh, by the folks at Ethereum. They proposed this bulletproof based Verkle. And again, by Chris Picard et al., they proposed a homomorphic lattice based Verkle tree. So, okay, so to conclude kind of this talk, what is the, the most fantastic tree that we hope to get uh, and that I encourage all of you to, to, to explore in your research? Well, obviously it has to be maintainable because it's a tree. And I put this here because you can come up with some uh, tree-based constructions that have lock size proofs but are actually not maintainable, but the proofs are not easy to update. So it has to be maintainable. It has to have aggregation. Uh, homomorphism is a good property to have for stateless cryptocurrencies. Database friendliness is also a good property to have uh, in those applications. Small proofs, concretely speaking, computationally efficient, concretely speaking, constant size public parameters, ideally. Uh, and of course, other nice properties, if we can get post quantumness, that would be great. Unstealability, perhaps, maybe compressible proofs, this idea of taking a log size proof and compressing it down to a constant size proof. Those would all be nice things to have. And uh, in addition to all of the open problems I mentioned in the previous talk, here are a few concrete directions for future work that, that I've been keeping in the back of my head, but never had enough cycles to work on. So first of all, can we get tree-based VCs from the speed log assumptions? And uh, th there was an earlier talk today on the speed log assumptions and trees. So there's some progress in that, or from RSA assumptions. And we have some ongoing work uh, on the RSA assumptions uh, 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 line. In particular, we believe the Catalano Fiore construction can be turned into a tree, but computationally it doesn't work out, it's too inefficient. So feel free to talk to me if you're interested in that. Uh, second of all, can we build the authenticated multi-point evaluation trees from different polynomial commitment schemes, like dark polynomial commitment schemes in RSA groups uh, that could actually allow us to do uh, proof aggregation in AMTs because these polynomial commitments support a multiplicative homomorphism in addition to an additive homomorphism. Um, and if you have a multiplicative homomorphism in AMTs, you can aggregate as far as I can tell. Uh, but there are challenges there too. Uh, Vertical tree aggregation would be interesting to explore using chains and cycles of elliptic curves. Um, and finally, vertical aggregation could also be explored by using this new homomorphism proposed by PyCard et al, combined with the snark friendliness of the lattice-based constructions. Uh, there's also some work on building VCs from subgroup hiding, but they're constant size VCs. So can you do VCs that are tree-based from subgroup hiding? Uh, what, what kind of things can you get there? So you'd be using composite order pairing friendly groups. Um, they wouldn't be so efficient, but maybe new ideas can be sparked. Um, lastly, there's a connection with digital signature schemes in a lot of these vector commitment schemes. So Catalano Fiore has some connections with the uh, 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 Hohenberg Waters uh, digital signature scheme and KZG10 is connected to Bonnet Boyen short signatures. Um, in general, it'd be interesting to think of um, whether there's a transformation here that gives a VC given a digital signature scheme and what, it, what does that imply for tree-based VCs? And uh, lastly, I have this um, overview of all of the work, this table that kind of uh, uh, surveys the field. So I'm not gonna present everything in it, but I'll leave it here for you guys to look at. Um, and I think with that, uh, I, I wanna conclude and, and take questions. Thank you so much. I hope you're all inspired to work on trees after this talk. Thank you, Alin. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I have a, one question, one quick question. Please. When you talked about the dark uh, polynomial commitment, um, so everybody, so the, one of the things about the dark polynomial commitment is that we could do it even without the trusted setup with the with that other assumption, like the I don't remember the class groups, right? Hmm. Um, how how inefficient is that compared to our side? Do you know or the, the class group compared to yeah, our side? I, I or yeah, yeah. There are implementations out there. I think Chia, which is a cryptocurrency company, implemented uh, class groups. Uh, 
I remember asking some folks at some point and, and they were not too concerned about the inefficiency. I think there was even a claim that it's roughly on the same order of efficiency, uh, but I suspect it's a little bit less efficient. Uh, the other complication with class groups is that usually like the, the assumptions are a bit different when you instantiate these things from class groups. So there are things that don't hold in class groups that hold in RSA groups and can run into problems. So you have to be really care careful when you use class groups. Um, but but yeah, um, to avoid the trust to set up in dark column admittance, you'd probably want to use class groups and you might lose even more efficiency in addition to RSA. And you might be right. to be you might need to be extra careful when uh, uh, proving security of your scheme. Okay. I, I mean, this is Dario. Hi, Dario. Um, I have a question about the your vertical aggregation question. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure uh -huh. So, um, like in the, I mean, when you do the, build this vertical tree, so even if there is a way to aggregate uh, the openings along the path, I mean, right. it seems to me that there is an inherent problem that you should provide commitment, and this might not be yeah. aggregatable. And you know, that's right. Are you, do you think that this is uh, solvable or? Yeah. Because then otherwise, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I claim this is solvable. I mean, I, I claim, uh, I, I want this to be solvable. Uh, so you're right, like you can aggregate these proofs, but what about the commitments? Right. right? So that's right. what, what uh, Vitalik pointed out. Let, let's cross aggregate these. Uh, we still have to send the commitments. Now, if you think about the, these new techniques by PyCard at all, uh, they they do not need to, they, when they compute the vertical, what's the problem? The problem is that these are group elements. You have to hash them into a field element so that you can compute the commitment here at Z. So this is not really Y1, I'm kind of lying here. This would be hash of Y1 here. Mm -hmm. And that's where you lose the snark friendliness or the IPA friendliness. And, and that's where you kind of lose the ability to, to aggregate the commitments themselves efficiently. Now, but, but PyCard at all showed that, that if you use lattices, then you don't really need to hash, right? You actually get a homomorphic uh, uh, vertical yeah. tree, which I claim that uh, could be much more friendly for aggregation. I don't know how, but I, I, have, a, I have a hunch. <laughs> uh, so, so that's the idea. Uh, now, of course, it's gonna be lattice-based, which <laughs> uh, we don't know how to make too, too efficient in practice. But hey, you know, uh, at least we can aggregate vertical proofs, and uh, we'll let other people instantiate the lattice stuff more more efficiently. Okay. So so, so that would be the second the, the, the first idea with vertical aggregation. It would be sorry, uh, in in this uh, future work here, uh, vertical aggregation via PPS twenty one homomorphism and SNARKs or IPAs, I should say, right? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Some something like that. Uh, but the the other idea would be. You know, can you use some chain cycle of elliptic curve thing to remove this need of uh, of uh, hashing the group elements to the field elements? So, like, when I if if when I compute the vertical here, sorry for making you all dizzy with the slides, but if when I compute the vertical here, what if I don't need to hash these group elements because I can maybe use the, their x coordinate, which is a field element. And just uh, use that as as the input to the vector commitment on the next level, which uses a chain of elliptic curves, something like that. So I think that I mean, it's actually to... something that we have explored a little bit, uh, yes. but we didn't yes. see the advantages because even if you can do use these cycles, like the way you encode things, uh, still break the homomorphic properties of the let's say the other group. Uh, like, by the way you encode least, things, you mean? So let's say that uh, you um, now you want to commit to group elements, uh, right? So you want to com commit to group elements that are, each group element is actually a pair of field elements that are in your message space. But then the problem is that, uh, I mean, you can do it, right? And this probably uh, avoids to make an expensive hashing, uh, but, uh, many other properties like breakdown. For example, you lose any homomorphic property of the commitment because mm, committing mm. to the points of the elliptic curve, mm, I mean, add, let's say adding over the field the pairs of elliptic curve uh, points does not correspond to, a, to the group operation, for example. Mm. Um, but maybe from an engineering perspective of analyzing mm, 
you know, avoiding rushing from groups to field, maybe this, this could make sense. Right, yes. Yeah, unfortunately I don't, I'm not a, a, a master in elliptic curves. So uh, uh, if I knew more, I, I could think a little bit um, about like, hmm. Yeah, I, I suspect that there's still creative things we can do here by leveraging some 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 chaining, some cycling uh, of that sort. Um, but yeah, that's why I'm leaving it as an as an open problem. Makes sense. Thanks. And Thank you. I see that Chris has a question. Oh yeah, a, a great talk. Uh, lots of really cool stuff to think about. Um, I was curious about the techniques. Um, Involving these like repeat uh, these uh, you know sequential division by uh, by polynomials either linear or, or higher degree and then moving to lower degree, is there any um, way in which the operations here are are commuted are commuting? So you know divide by x minus one and then divide mm. by x two minus zero or something. Are these th these commute in any way? Um, I wasn't able to work it out into my mind. The, uh, let, let me bring up the slide just so, so, so uh, com what, what exactly uh, is the question about commuting? So what do you think should commute? Uh, well, I guess, yeah, it's not an entirely well-posed question, but suppose I, uh, you know, here I'm dividing by X3 minus something and then I'm dividing by mm. X2 minus something. Yes. And suppose I flip, you know, do it in the yes. opposite order. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the question really is, is this actually a tree or is it more like a tensor where um, the order, you know, where you can maybe do, do things in any order, right? Or permute the order yeah. in which you do these. And is there any advantage to that? Yeah, um, so it, they do commute. Uh, like you could, I don't think, uh, so you could compute this tree by starting with X1 minus zero, X1 minus one. Then doing x2 at this level and x3 at that level. You could do it that way too. It would be a different tree, but it would still have uh, uh, security. Uh, so, so, so does that, for example, uh, answer your question? Uh, not exactly. I guess I'm. What I'm trying to get at is whether, um, yeah, I mean, the the order in which you do these is arbitrary, uh, you know, for each at each level. But it's more that um, you know, if I divide by, so if I think about the doing two steps here, like dividing by x3 minus zero and then by x2 minus zero. Okay, that's mm -hmm. dividing by x2, x3, right? And mm -hmm. the order, you know, x2 and x3 commute. Um, so the overall quotient will be the same uh, regardless of which, you know, whether I do two first and then three or three first and then two. Uh, um, the, individual, yeah, so, mm -hmm. the individual remainders maybe won't be the same. Um, but the quote, the ultimate quotient will be the same, right? So I uh, actually, I, I, I believe that if you divide by x to minus zero first, you get, let's say Q3, and then you divide that remainder by x2 minus zero, you get Q2, let's say. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you were to flip, if you were to start with x2 minus zero, you'd get a Q2 prime. You wouldn't get the same Q2 that you got here. For now, sure, but then after I divide, but, but then after I divide yeah. by x3 minus zero, I'll get the same. Q two three, let's say. Uh, the same. The if it's so, a quotient. So in this order, like you get Q three, Q two, and if you flip, I think you get Q two prime, Q three prime. If you uh, right, but what I'm, I guess, what I'm trying to see is the quotient after. Uh, oh, sorry. So you take the remain. Um, maybe I misunderstand the first step. So I get a quotient and a remainder. From the first step, mm -hmm. and then I take oh, I take remainder and divide by x two. Yes, that... yes, yes. I see. Okay, not the quotient divided by x two. Yeah. Yes. I, right. What I was thinking is if you divide each quotient right. by the next thing, then they kind of commute. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. So there's some intrinsic order here. Yes. Um, hmm. I'm wondering, is there a way to transform? Uh, you know, if you change the order of these things, can you more efficiently transform the tree to the to its you know prime uh, values, right? To its updated values. Is there any use mm. of that? 
uh, to its, uh, how do you mean update the tree to its uh, updated value? Well, like you said, uh, you know, if I do X2 first and then X3, I get a Q, Q prime two and then a Q prime three. Hmm. Uh, so if I, if I knew Q2 and Q3, could I then efficiently transform them to, to Q3 mm. prime, Q2 prime, something like that. Mm. Is, mm -hmm. is there some use? Mm -hmm. I, this see, just, it gives me the feeling that there's no inherent real order here and that right. it's somewhat, somewhat arbitrary. And so yes, maybe this is like a, a tree where you can access any level cheaply or something like that, which might be useful. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I, I put in the chat a reference to the paper that uh, that first explored these multilinear polynomial commitments and these repeated divisions um, uh, for everyone. Yeah. What uh, can I say something? Uh, sure. Are you are you done or sorry? I I might interrupt. Yeah, that, that that's all I was uh, interested in. Thank you. No, so I want to say that I thought about something like what Chris said um, in a different context. Um, so I, I, for update proving, for updating proofs, I'm not sure because like you already pre-computed them in some order. So I don't know how this could help. But what I was thinking is um, for subset openings, um, like um, if you open certain positions, then you can build maybe the tree in a specific order so that um, like you can group some of the openings mm -hmm. in, a, in a certain way or something like that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We, we, indeed. Like, I think uh, I don't think we proved this, but I think like if you just gave this quotient and this quotient, that could serve as a subvector proof for these positions. Uh, we haven't written the security reduction for that, but I think that should work. I believe that works in AMPs at least. I'm not sure about hyperproofs, uh, but they're quite analogous. So then, to what extent? I don't think. I don't know if you could reorder these in any arbitrary way though. Like for example, I don't know how you could put this leaf next to this leaf when their divisions are by different things. Well, the, uh, the way I think about these trees usually is like uh, it, you have leaves um, and you number them in binary and then um, yeah, like not like they are, <laughs> they are labeled in by a lower, mm, well, they have a label of binary bits. And then like what I was thinking is something like um, you want to open up positions and, uh, and you look in which coordinates they coincide. And then you could like somehow build a tree so that the maximum number is like grouped in a certain way. Um, hmm. But but then like if you like the proofs are already pre-computed then I think like somehow this doesn't help. Hmm. Like if you had to compute them on the fly, like you could do something. Yeah. Yes, we've had a lot of difficulty coming up with aggregation for these two construction hyperproofs and AMPs without uh, black boxes like IPAs and SNARKs. Uh, my only hope is that that for the AMP construction, we can take a proof and uh, turn it into a KCG proof. That would be amazing. But I. It doesn't seem to. It doesn't seem possible. It seems to require a homomorph, a, a multiplicative homomorphism. And if you read the blog post that I have, uh, that I have uh, here, you can kind of tell how how you can turn an AMP proof into a KCG proof. Although I don't spell it out specifically, uh, but they're quite related algebraically. It's just that you seem to need a a multiplicative homomorphism. Um, maybe there's other things you can do. I don't know. Uh, thanks for all the questions, everyone, by the way. Um, 